I think their goal is to Oh, really? He was just a disembodied voice, I guess. Yes. Or email. Since we doubled up on lunches for the tutorial. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. We need one volunteer to take notes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just code stuff. Yeah. I think I 
So whoever's taking notes can, can take notes in here. Welcome everybody. Uh, this is the two-chain working group. We'll try to discuss where are we right now in FreeBSD on the dual chain and what are future direction and try to get feedback from everybody, trying to understand what people think and what's missing uh, and so on. So current status, just to sum up, Clang is default compiler on our tier 1 architectures and we are currently working to get LLD in shape to build uh, world and kernel and hopefully boards by the end of this year so we have full x86-64 and ARM64 support we can link build world everything is fine ex and there is some small missing linker script support and build kernel is a work in progress at least for for now what actually really worries me right now is lack of support for tier 2 and tier 3 architecture in particular MIPS, Spark64 and so, if somebody has an opinion about it, I would like to uh, hear from them and see what's going on. So, the rough schedule we have for today is the one that you see on the slide. It's like trying to talk about MIPS, which is probably the most troublesome architecture in particular for health support because uh, the ABI is very complicated and supporting Clang as it is right now is not great and also in LLD it's sort of lagging behind and same for PowerPC and, and Spark Risk 5 it's actually I have no idea about what is the current status but <laughs> Apparently, there are people that are working on it. Um, um, basically, also, we want to see if we can evaluate for architectures that are not tier one, or tier two, or tier three. If we can bring an, an external GPL v3 to chain. So, there are some architectures which have better support in GCC than they have in Clang. And so bringing external new deals as ARM64 does right now, but shipping that by default may help us to completely remove GCC from base. And then GDB and LDB probably had can comment on this further as he is sort of like leading this effort. GDB shipped in base uh, is currently, I think, used mostly for kernel debugging because KGDB, uh, because it's like a very ancient version of GDB. And what is actually shipped in port is generally superior to what is shipped in base. And so 
Uh, LLTB actually is built by default right now, but it's built by default right now. LLTB yeah, it's built by default, but it's not currently complete enough to replace GDP. So there is this version import, and there is like this weird state. Sort of like advanced topic is like link time optimization. The linker that we ship in base is currently not able to uh, do LTO, and also in general, the whole toolchain that we ship in base, uh, um, NM and AR, which are needed to read LLVM bit code, uh, they are not able to read LLVM bit code as they are right now. So we need sort of uh, understanding if. Uh, FreeBSD wants to move to at least provide an alternative build that has uh, LTO, link time optimizations. And this, these are like pretty invasive changes in the build system and in the tool chain. And build ID, I think it's deterministic build, right? Uh, Purity, that's the option to include a hash. On the yeah, to include the yeah. hash, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'm not very familiar with that, but somebody else can talk about it. So I would like to hear from you if you, yeah. Regarding link time optimizations, yes. doesn't that also affect the code base that you need to declare uh, global symbols which should not be eliminated if not used? Something like a garbage collection of symbols. Sections? Uh, like you say, sections? No. No. Don't, don't you need to declare, like, uh, what's it called? Uh, API function or to declare so that the linker knows the symbol cannot be skipped because it's used uh, by kernel modules. No, what, what happens, it's actually, I think, the other way around. So basically, the linker changes the linkage of function from external to internal before calling the optimizer. So actually, this can make optimization more effective. But in general, it's the linker that tells which symbol can be can, can, can keep, it's not the programmer, it's completely transparent. The way LTO works, and we tried that, is just you pass a single flag to the build, and that magically enables. Right, but, 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 but how, if you have a linker that has a global function mm -hmm. in the kernel, for example, some, some function that's global, and it's not used in the kernel, but it's used by kernel modules. Oh yeah, in that case you need something like attribute used. Yeah, that's yeah, needs that's what I'm uh, yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. Basically, you can build some single function sections that are sections, and if you see sections, you can use LTO. It's the same logic that's used with the side, you can cap them on. So function sections that are sections work, so LTO should be. LTO is more powerful. We should, we should really have the annotations. We should have annotations for those symbols anyway, because we shouldn't be yeah. exporting any symbols that we don't explicitly have to mean to okay. export. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never mind that we happily bind to static symbols as well. In kernel models, we just said that we allow other models to bind to static symbols coming from us. Is there anything on this list that somebody is interested in working on or some? No, <laughs> I don't think so. No, question, when you say MIPS, what, what do you need from MIPS? Uh, so actually, um, Sean Bruno started an effort trying to build world with Clang mm -hmm. on MIPS and things sort of failed. There were some missing uh, directive in the integrated assembler and the linker needs support for that. Okay, I think that's actually something that uh, non-goal uh, until Silang uh, improves uh, support for MIPS. Yeah. 
upstream, yeah. just kind of pointless trying to beat it into submission, trying to build FreeBSD. Uh, and we better, uh, that's my opinion, cycles are better spent uh, uh, making f external tool chain working better. Yeah. Well, in general, like, while we have like almost full control of the linker, because like lots of people working on FreeBSD actually develop on the linker, and we can sort of decide what are the direction. This is not true in all Clang, also because there is not really a huge understanding of how the MIPS API works. So generally, I think that probably MIPS uh, is the best candidate for external toolchain. If like, I'm not sure, I haven't tried the GCC support recently, and I don't know if they have like better coverage than what Clang has. So, Yes. Yeah, I build uh, MIPS with external toolchain from time to time. Uh, mm -hmm. It usually results in a couple of warnings that needs mm -hmm. to be fixed, but otherwise it kind of works. For uh, both 32 and 64 bit targets. The, um, mm -hmm. the Imagination Tech people have been putting some effort into the LVM toolchain uh, for MIPS as well. So Somewhere, uh, it's just pointless to us to try to do it. I mean, CLAN is just not there for MIPS yet. When it's there, we can, we can revisit the making it uh, Silan platform, but now it's just pointless. Do you have any insight, Brooks? Um, I can build everything in user space except C++, and that's, I'm not building that for totally unrelated reasons. And we have a kernel to build that boots. So I think we probably have some outer tree patches, but not a huge number. Um, it's not. It's not the lip group, but it's definitely at the point where it mostly needs exercise. Uh, I think we did, might have had to do some assembly hacks to get the kernel to boot because the code is mostly non pick except when it isn't. Um, so. Yeah, so it's, not a, it's not at all a production quality compiler, uh, but it is at the point where it needs beating on. Yeah. Uh, are you talking about Clang or GCC? Clang. Yeah. And what are the issues with the integrated assembler? Because there were lots of complaints on IRC. There's a it. modest number of missing pseudos, um, which are not, which are easy to just replace. And it's not a large number of patches. They should, they should be fixed upstream. I'm not. I think we've submitted most of them. I think so. But we should. Well, next time I do a big dip of our tree, I, I should. <coughs> check that the pseudos I've replaced with that I've expanded still need expanding and if they aren't I should fix the bugs. So for the for the benefit of anyone who has not had the uh, joy of looking at um, MIPS assembly, um, there are a whole bunch of instructions that aren't actually instructions. They're um, they're basically macros of the assembler expands to multiple instructions um, and uh, claims integrated assembler lack support for many, many of those um, until recently. Okay. Well, MIPS, somebody will take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, next on the list, uh, PowerPC, Justin, well, uh, have you tried recently? I, I, I haven't tried building PowerPC recently, last time I tried, Uh, it doesn't set up the stack frame in the right order yet. It, the 
assumes it, it assumes the uh, red zone that Darwin and RPC sixty four has, so which is a two hundred eighty eight byte uh, buffer that is that that is used. That's not true for L32. So if we can fix that and how to create a stack right before populating the stack, then it should work just fine. That's, I believe, the last bit for 32. Yeah. Do we know who uh, in all VMs is doing any PPC? Uh, Hal, probably. Hal, but a uh, very specific RPC. Like yeah. he has one machine he cares about. Yeah. Power eight, power nine. So that's oh. PPC. No. Or oh. even that is like he works for yeah. own, right? So it's like he has one supercomputer he wants to support. Right. IBM guys are working, but then they're working on the shiny new stuff. So yeah. I tried power PC six for myself on the machine that made them here, but uh, there was a flag that was accepted by Glang and actually Nathan told me that it's needed because otherwise uh, uh, yes, that breaks uh, DDB breakpoint or stack trace, I don't remember it. Exactly. Yeah, there, yeah, there are a couple things that we can hack around by generating the assembly with GCC and keeping the assembly Assembler can handle it. It's just that compiler does generate the local calls. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, on the compiler side, I think so we're almost there. There, there, there. There's a bug over here in LLVM. Uh, can you find that and we'll link it? Or like just give us. Uh, yeah. yeah. Because I. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> linker support. There is an initial link of support. It actually, I think it links a lower, I tried, and there is no support for table of contact and tags on our PC, so that that needs some work. Okay. Spark. And by the way, did yeah. you start, it's there, it's only for PC64. No, there is also power PC back. I pretty I there is enough to link up static hello world that goes directly to the kernel. Yeah. Like it, it, it the only reason there is a power PC thirty two there is to best support for thirty two bit big engine. Like mm -hmm. there in practice there isn't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Uh, are you familiar with the API? How hard would we do? The 32 bit one, I think it's pretty simple. The 64 bit one, the old one, is a bit complicated. LV2 is nicer. Uh, Spark, when I say Spark, I think it's, everybody agrees it's Spark 64. And there's been lots of discussion about removing the support entirely from FreeBSD. I'm not sure if there is anybody here, but uh, the supporting LLVM for Spark is relatively primitive. Uh, I don't get with Marius, and he tried that, and he actually needs compiles, and when it compiles, it generates not great code, so that's something that if there is somebody that's interested, we can discuss, otherwise we'll just skip it. Uh, risk five. Uh, there is lots of interest, but I'm not really familiar, so probably I can comment on that. Yeah, I can, I can say something. Yeah. <laughs> so we use uh, external like, Moodle chain on this file, with GCC 5.2. And there is some uh, support in the LVM, but it is outdated or incomplete. Uh, so we can only we, we only have uh, work in GCC uh, Moodle chain. Works. There is lots of warnings during build, but we build in both kernel and user space, and uh, now we're building modules as well as big. Uh, 
Yeah, so excellent to change what is this file. Okay. Hopefully we will support LVM soon, someday, but it doesn't seem there is some active development on that. Do you have an external branch or like do you have a fork on LLVM or it's like there is no work? There was no work done. There is some branch, yes, in GitHub, uh, in, in Berkeley, uh, GitHub account. And I don't look at that, this, at that um, already a lot, many, a lot of time. Uh, and I'm not sure really what the status, but. It doesn't seem that someone lo working on that activity. Yeah. Good. Uh, the other architecture missing from this list is ARM64, which seems to be in a great shape, actually. If it works. Uh, Andrew Tarbner, I'm not sure if it's around. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we just we just got this week uh, ARM64 to work with Linker, and so I'm not sure if we are we are almost able to basically take uh, uh, the inutil support and replace it. So well, what 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 was what was the rationale for having uh, the new? Uh, the ARM64 shipping with the baggage for uh, for being used. The base digital is 12. So we only need it. We can only use next gen of Vinitos. Okay. Yeah, in the source tree. Oh, yeah. It has no support. Oh, in GPL, we before ARM is announced 64 mil architecture. Which, which tools are actually used other than the linker and and then maybe, right? I think the yeah, interface uses is in the linker. Okay. Everything else we now use our toolchain anyway. Yeah. Um, there is one port I know of which one's opt dump, I think. It may we may need need to someone to it's, it's just <coughs> to find out. Uh, if you which the C plus plus you're using or something like that. But a any any port that requires the utils parts could just depend on the utils port, right? Yeah. Um, uh, except for the linker, because that would be easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'd have a problem of how do you. Have no, but I mean, a, a port that needs obj dump or. Uh, well, I guess obj dump is the only one. Or if it needs an assembler for specifically. Yeah, the only one I've seen is the one that they touched Okay. Uh, the archiver, you use the archiver in base, you have the support for that, AR? Um, I think so. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I forgot to change it. Uh, the, the AR in base is, um, uh, it is, uh, it's a cousin of the one in Elf tool chain. Um, <laughs> it's not, uh, it, it started out in um, in FreeBSD uh, using um, LibArchive, and Alphatool Chain subsequently picked it up. Um, but the one in FreeBSD still has its own has its own ancestry right now. Uh, but there's nothing in it that is machine dependent, so it doesn't matter. Okay. So tools, what's missing? Other. Other than the linker, there is actually some other small places, small pieces of uh, GPL that are still in the tree. And yeah, those needs to be replaced probably by L2 chain because it seems to be a little bit more mature for the link for the tools. Too. Um, so the only the only video tools right now are LD, AS, and Opsha. Okay. Yeah. The the assembler is like completely missing from LBM, so that's something we we may want to take a look at. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of assembler can use Clank as a assembler. Yeah, I I mean I think 
I don't think it would be much work. Um, there's no one's done it to, to write a, a front end that you can invoke as a yes. Um, I haven't. I haven't actually seen packages so far that they but. Yeah, I've, so I've done that for x86. Um, yeah, AMD64, um, I think everything everything built if you have no answers, it's fine. Um, I386, uh, so our build infrastructure uses, invokes the assembler if it's a dot lowercase s file, and it invokes um, the, uh, the compiler to assemble it if it's a capital S, because it wants the preprocessor. Um, and so, AMD64, it's all capital S files, and uh, I386 has some crypto lowercase s files. Um, I think I think it works if I just rename or, or just told it to use the, the preprocessor uh, and, and it's the compiler for all. Is there any reason not to change the code rule? <coughs> to just always use always use the compiler? Uh, probably not, right? Yeah, we, we talked about it briefly a few months ago. I think we should just change it to be all consistent. Yeah. It seems like people really want just a simple, usually one NASA thing, right? Or something <coughs> like it. Some weird, yeah. Have uh, you also tried to build in ports? Uh, yeah, I asked for an X run with no assembler. Yeah, that. That would be uh, that would be nice to understand because also for LLD we realized that even if we build we are able to do build world lots of ports fail because they rely on some weird feature and I'm not sure if they actually invoke there may be ports that invoke AES directly there could be so <coughs> yeah there are there are a lot of ports that invoke to AES directly. Often try to modify that to use uh, the compiler directly because uh, the infrastructure works better the way we have written it. But you still have a lot of ports using the AES directly. There are also lots of ports that invoke the linker directly by any chance. Yeah, so there's, I would say, a few now. There used to be a lot, and uh, I don't remember which work we did on the post three that highlights all those ports that we have to switch to uh, to calling the, um, the compiler as an as a linker and say that that's the right job. So it's really that I would say that it's mostly fixed. Okay. But the assembler is a working problem. Uh, I don't know. Uh, needs to be fixed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So LLD, just to repeat, x86-64 and ARM64 support is there, complete. Lynx build work, build kernel is in progress. And uh, we did a port run, and about 10k packages pass, and like 8k are skipped because libpng fails. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think libpng, and there was some other like huge dependency, I don't remember. Uh, oh, Glib, 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 and so like everything was good. So yeah, that's a work in progress. They don't fail for like very weird reason. Basically, they don't fail because there was a issue parsing the the version script that Glib provides. And so yeah, that, once that's fixed, uh, the, we will run another expran and see what's going on. So. Yeah. I just looked at the, the PR on yeah. AMD 64, oh. 11, 11 ports failed um, with no user bin AS and, okay. and 200 skips. Okay. How compatible is uh, the, the, what LLD generates compared to uh, details generation? Uh, as for the reason is right now I cannot update the port 3 to the latest version because it's compatible with the one we have in base system. And uh, the generate object of packages. Well, the generate things that are incompatible. Uh, the main issue uh, I have are due to bad build system that uses, for example,
example, install the tool and you end up having two linker, the one from base and the one from the compiler, uh, being together. So I cannot update the details and I'm expecting that as uh, this kind of situation, I hope that it will happen if we have LD instead of LD. So I don't know which details, so maybe it's just some relocation that makes uh, LD from base crash. Okay, so yeah, the, the reason you ABI, which is PAC ABI, and basically like emits some, so the assembler may emit different relocation. Yeah. Uh, because you can avoid like jumps to the global offset table. And I'm pretty sure that uh, LD in base does recognize those, so it's very likely that uh, is gonna crash, but uh, I assume that LLD is gonna be back compatible and should have all the new features, so it should be like on par with what AES speeds up. Uh, I th think so, but if there are bugs, we may want to fix. If you have like actually a way to reproduce this uh, relocation failure, that would be. Oh, I have a bunch of faucets for sure always breaks when I build them. So I can try uh, with LD and tell you what's uh, Yeah, so yeah, the LLD that's in Dimitri's branch is very old, so I recommend you to get the one from uh, uh, from master and try just passing as dash f use dash LD, well LLD and see what breaks and if there are bugs we will be able to fix them. Okay, so uh, external toolchain, while we are talking, do you, you did the original work for the external toolchain, right? Well, Bruce started it. So oh, Bruce. I did it. <laughs> okay. Bruce started it. <laughs> so, where are we with that? I think that we're in pretty good shape. Uh, we're providing right now GCC uh, stripped down so that we don't have any library provided, we use all the one from the base system. Uh, Bin utils we provide for every architectures, and we have some CI using. Uh, we have AMD 64 dash GCC uh, Jenkins that builds using uh, the XL, uh, GCC. I think we're pretty good. Last time, which was one year and a half ago, I was able to uh, boot some Spark 64 totally built with uh, recent uh, Bin utils. And uh, it was only GCC 5.4.9 that type. So right now we are at 5.3. I should update that to 5.4 in the next weeks. So uh, it's, a, it's about time we do the switch. Yeah, so the only issue I figured out recently is that Compiler RT is missing some, uh, some new symbols uh, exposed by GCC since 4.9 when you do some optimizations, like uh, underscore underscore CPU model, uh, underscore underscore CPU something. So we don't have that in our uh, compiler RT as the base. Uh, so that brought, that brought the tree two days ago and I did it with UCL. I had to sell the optimization. But that's the only, only problem I, I'm aware of it with this to chain, not the way While we are talking about ports, there is something that has been brought to my attention many times, but I never had the time to look at, is libquatmat. Quatmat. I'm not sure if you ever found some problems with that, because like there, is, there are some ports which depend on that, and libc++ has no support for it, so there are some issues. Uh, we've got two issues, the most three, by having Clang at the base system. It was first Fortran because we don't have Fortran, and then you depend on uh, using GCC for that, and you try to mix libraries, runtime libraries from GCC and the one from the base system. The other one was uh, OpenMP, but from my testing, it's fixed by uh, I added the ports, uh, I OpenMP. 
the short very well on on, uh, on the AP64. I haven't tried yet on uh, IE386, so this one will be fixed soon. Uh, I have to commit some changes to the base system, so I'm a little bit dependent anymore on GCC. And it also works with old GCC, uh, old tank like 3.4. I don't. I, I, I link that. I, I need to go through my IRC logs. And I'm interested like, in the uh, Yeah, like I, it's like for some quad math precision. I'm not entirely sure who needs that, but they will need that. And I remember this one actually. Well, I'm pretty sure it's about the case. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay. Okay. So GDP and LDP, uh, do you want to? Sure. Yeah. So as David mentioned, um, I imported LDB a while back, and it's now enabled on AMD sixty four, um, which is the the only architecture where it's um, it's really usable for us uh, today. Um, Actually, it, it, there is ARM, um, ARM support as well. Um, Have you used it on ARM 64 bit? So, AM64, ARM, and ARM64, uh, uh, there's, there's some level of support. There's no kernel debugger support um, right now. There's no equivalent of KGDB. Um, and as mentioned, um, that's That's really the only the kernel debugger support. Really, the only reason that we have um, have GDB in base um, or the GDB in base is, is still useful. Um, the uh, John Baldwin did a bunch of work to get uh, kernel support into GDB uh, in the ports tree. So GDB seven nine has um, has kernel debug support and. Uh, one of the things that we we'll want to talk about at the, um, the, FreeBS, the future session uh, discussion in the, the Dev Summit tomorrow is whether we want to just drop the debugger completely, uh, drop GDB from base, um, and rely on installing the port or using LLDB um, in, in the future. Uh, John? How fast is LLDB churning these days? Um, so it, uh, when I was doing the initial FreeBSD port and importing snapshots into FreeBSD, it was, um, it was moving very, very quickly. Um, it has stabilized quite a lot. Um, now to the, so when I did the earlier imports, um, I would just pick a snapshot from head and adapt it to the version of GC, or of client that we had in the base system, um, because LLDB was moving ahead very, very quickly, and um, uh, earlier on it wasn't even doing releases tied to client releases. It was just, if you wanted to use LLDB, um, a, a head snapshot was the only only real way to, to get it. Um, I think as of probably Clang LLVM 3.7, um, the, the LLDB release that went with Clang and LLVM 3.7 is uh, was workable, and then um, for the 3.8 import, um, we also just brought in um, LLDB 3.8, and at this point, um, the I think we'll just use that approach, um, cheap and occasional fixes if necessary. Uh, but largely speaking, the FreeBSD support that's in LLDB now is is basically workable, um, but we'll need a rewrite. Um, so when LLDB was first developed the, um, for Linux, uh, the port, when, when the port was first done for Linux, they implemented it with an in-process debugging model. So the, um, I mean, like, like a conventional the way GDB or, or any sort of debugger would, would be written, um, the, the debugger actually owns the, the inferior process. Um, and this is, this isn't the way um, LLDB was implemented on OS X, where, where it originated. 
and is not the way it's, um, it, it works on Linux today. So on OS X and Linux, LLDB um, <coughs> effectively treats all debugging as remote debugging. And so there's a debug server um, that LLDB talks to for the actual uh, breakpoints and single stepping and inspecting memory and whatnot. Um, and so even on OS X, if you're using Xcode and, and using LLDB, um, all debugging is actually going through a debug server, um, whether it's over a TCP socket or, or talking to um, the debug server running on the same host. <coughs> and we'll want to migrate the FreeBSD support to use that same model um, for, for a number of reasons. It, it, if, you want to support, um, if you want to support remote debugging, then it's really no extra work, um, and it means that your, your remote debug case actually gets tested and is known, known to work. Um, and it also simpl uh, it simplifies a lot of um, uh, thread and um, uh, concurrency issues because the debug, um, debug server is its own separate process. Um, I did have a Google Summer of Code student uh, last year, um, or two years, well I guess two years ago, yeah, two, years, two, two years ago now, um, implement a initial take on kernel debug support for LLDB. And it's, um, it's, an, it, it's sort of a, a somewhat usable proof of concept, but it was not at a state where it's something that could be, um, could be directly used. Um, so we'll either have to pick that up again or just re-implement. Was that actually committed upstream or no. there is just a patch? It's just a patch, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a shame. So you, we do think that it is worth shipping a debugger. Like I know previously, it was rolling so fast that the, the base system LLDB was almost useless, and you just always had to install a package. But mm -hmm. that's not the case anymore. So for my my own systems, um, I use uh, for my my um, uh, current on my laptop. Um, I just use LLDB that was in the that's in the base uh, base system now that came with 3.8, and it's. Um, it is at least as good as GCC 6.6 in the base system, um, which isn't saying much. But um, <laughs> it uh, uh, no, it, it is it is actually usable for for most sort of basic uh, uh, cases in core file analysis. Support is in um, in the tree now. Working. The thirty-two bit support is working in the tree now. Yes. Um, I, I last I, the last bit I made was so it was about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And ultimate support. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if we should just turn it on um, in build world. Um, yeah, we can as long as it can compile. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so basically enable it if the compiler. So uh, C++. Yeah. Yes. Like in in the same uh, uh, options block that that uh, enables um, other things for C++ eleven. If your if your compiler is C++ eleven compiler. Yeah. So what's the <laughs> Linkers are never done, <laughs> but yeah, it's enough to link large part of the pieces. I mean, like the machine dependent support is almost always there. Rafael, maybe yeah. a micro. Yeah, the machine um, dependent support is almost always there. Model bias is there. Yeah. 
like uh, then there's like yeah, machine independent like we have support linker scripts. We have support yeah. like so, version scripts. So basically, if if linker script and version script support was um, was usable in a machine independent fashion, then we would probably be able to um, to drop the um, dependency on dependency support for building for build role. Uh, so, so yeah. yeah. I don't think there is any there any any piece of linker script that's actually machine dependent, but you never know which to know. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Yeah, so at LLDP, I think somebody committed the basic support for LLDP. But yeah, Andy and I worked on that. Yeah, I've got we did the, I did the kernel side, so breakpoints and things like that will work. Yeah. Um, I think it was just open point. Really was the base. I don't think yeah, so. I know Monaro and Dark, but I think they both DK. I think it's. Dark side looked at it, which is a few months ago now, it was close to 40 features, we couldn't look at them at all. So I think maybe they need to import files, I suspect we've got, um, they need to be, we just need to make sure that we're generating them correctly, the core files. Yeah, so I think um, uh, it's probably fair to say that both LLG and LLDB are pretty much feature parity with AMD64. ARM64 and AMD64 are, are basically at, uh, at parity, I would, I would think I know, it's, it's fair. I think, it, I think Lenaro is recently interested in FreeBSD for LLG. Yeah. Um, so I think they're interested in FreeBSD for LLG just because of the ports connection and because we're such a big user of it. Of, Is that fair to say? Do you think that um, it's the machine independent in, in both in both projects? Um, I mean, certainly it is the case for LLDB that the machine independent um, issues are the, are the outstanding ones. Yeah, I think so. I think that. Because you can have missing optimization for ARM64, like um, golf to load relaxation, but sure. like for Acmes, they were fair to each other. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? No. Okay. So I guess yeah. related to other LLVM related things, yeah. um, we have a research project in which we're going to be doing a bunch of things with LLVM in the base system and maybe hopefully the port industry as well. And so we're hoping to introduce more. suffix rules that don't need to be conditionally defined in bsd.lib.make as well as sys.make as well as contribbmake, lib.make and other places um, so that it would make it a lot easier to do things like, okay, give me the LLVM bit code version of this library or this binary, which help with LTO things that we want to talk about. Uh, very problematic for many reasons because it needs changes inside the build systems because basically uh, sorry yeah. LTO is actually very problematic because it has so potentially for kernels the peaks the winds are big because uh, Andy Clean tried this for Linux at Intel and uh, 
uh, on some real benchmark, like OLTP processing benchmark, um, sys batch, so some like database workload, the kernel was like six to ten percent faster. And it's also important because uh, uh, link time optimization, having whole executable visibility may reduce the size of the generated binaries, which may be important on embedded architectures. And uh, so there is a potential huge win for this. And now that we are very likely to ship LLD, we're gonna have full control over the whole chain, so we can ship with that. The, 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 the problem with link time optimization is the um, there are lots of places, or I mean, some places in FreeBSD, where in the build system, uh, the compiler is invoked using CC capital S to produce assembler files. And with LTO, instead of assembler files, basically you produce. Um, of, or you produce um, um, bit code files, which are the format that the LLVM optimizer can understand. And so the issue is that uh, the result of the compiler invocation in that is then passed to SAD or TR for some post processing. I'm not entirely sure what, if that can be avoided or not. But my understanding is that we need to make some modification in the build system and provide some option like with LTO, without LTO, and some conditionals. I'm not really aware about how, how, of how the build system works. And so, yeah, that, that may be. A bit. Those files can also just pass dash f no LTO that in the make file. If you're not doing LTO, that does nothing. If you're doing LTO, that just deserves LTO to that one. Um, yeah, that's true, but basically, uh, does every compiler understand f no LTO? Uh, like GCC understands f no LTO? Very likely, yes. Okay. So. And then there is this issue that has been pointed out that symbol needs to be to market with attribute use, otherwise they will be they will break. Yeah. Um, uh, build ID. I'm not entirely sure how we're gonna use that. So. I can give a brief, uh, yeah, yeah. Unless, unless you want to uh, explain it, but like what it is. Yeah. So it's just an option to tell the leaker to hash the output and like, put an ID on the file. So like, I'm not sure exactly what's in what's the yeah, Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, John. Yeah. Sorry. Before we get to build ID, yeah. while we're still talking about LTO, um, all this uh, tagging things with attributes would that be effectively? putting a mechanical description on what is our KPI. And if that were the case, you could then use LTO to say, well, if you build modules that use anything that's not in the KPI, then your mileage may vary. Because <laughs> that's potentially exciting, right? I, I think that's the effect you want, because you, yeah. you need to mark everything that you want to be available. And once you've done that, then you have, you have something you can check. And then we can say, and we don't support the existence of anything that isn't explicitly tagged with this attribute. And if you write a module that relies on anything else. I, yeah. Uh, I don't have a real use case for this, but maybe. Sorry. Hans. Hans. Do you have an example where this can happen? Like a real example? Public API, 
Yes. It, 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 it's just something I've seen with some valid part of doctors. I participated in, not directly related to previous, but I've seen frequently you need to use the garbage collection to get the uh, uh, executable size down. Okay. And uh, in that regard, you need to be careful to, to mark all circles. Uh, if you're building a, a dynamic object library. So, 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 that's something working somewhat with something called a KPI. They have something called export symbol or export GPM. And, and, and they do exactly that. They, they mark the uh, function as part of In general, LTO should keep everything that you use. If it's not this probably a bug in LTO, you shouldn't annotate. I can see the problem happening for GC sections, but for LTO, I mean, it, it may just be a bug in the link. Well, yeah. when we're touching this issue with sections and functions, no other operating system that I mark in its functions, for example, the previous two would be all system in functions as uh, being a separate section that can be freed up when they've been executed. So, has anyone thought about something like that for previous two that we can, can, can mark? Groups of functions that can be freed up when they're executed, no longer needed. What do you exactly mean with freed up? Now, uh, the, the code is residing in the ROM, right? So also swapped out. Yes, but the, in the kernel. The kernel is I, not I, I, I think you understand. So, like right now, normally you create three PT loads. Right, so there is like read write read only, and in particular, like you have like um, the GNU uh, read only segment, right? So it starts read write once you apply rotations, it can be up read only. You could have like the same way, like uh, an extra segment saying like this can be completely unloaded once the dynamic linker is done. So you could have like the location day itself could be there, like you could have like user five sections. Be there as well, so like once the linker is done with something, it just unloads the, the feature does not exist. I don't know anyone that proposed it, but it's doable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, one more thing. It's not yeah, related sure. to this topic. It's more in the linker. You, you, you 
mentioned that there are some linker scripts that needs to be translated. No, uh, parsed. Like the linker are the, the linker internally has no support for parsing or the construct. So when you pass a linker script, it just uh -huh. fails. No, not translated. So, no, so, just. so but, but, but that means we need to support the new LD linker syntax? We, we do support that already, just a subset of it. It has so, a missing feature to be implemented. Yeah, the, the goal, at least on LLD side, this is what almost everybody agrees, is that we implement linker script support for the construct that we actually need rather than like parsing the whole grammar because there are very weird constructs. So for example, the fact that uh, and, and the old linker, ld.bfd, is uh, driven, the linking is driven by the linker script, uh, makes the linker script grammar very, very expressive. And there are some directives like insert after or insert before that takes one section and insert after the another section or before another section, while um, not even gold implements that because you can obtain the same effect uh, just passing uh, to markers file as like CRT begin, CRT end, but similar to that. And so the goal is to implement at least enough to link FreeBSD because also I know there are some companies that want to link the FreeBSD kernel internally. And so that's, that's gonna be at least the first step. Then if there is request for other uh, features and they are actually reasonable to implement, not too crazy probably, we're gonna implement that, but we don't aim for the whole linker script support. Do you have anything in particular you were thinking of? No, no, I've been writing a little bit of script myself, not, not for free, but for some better projects. So, so I understand what you're saying, that linker scripts can be uh, kind of scary and strange. So I think, well, what I've seen with previous videos is that you don't need so much support in the linker. It's, it's like basic things, grabbing the code in a section, doctor, VSS. It's not so magic you need. And, uh, uh, so, but, but to, from, from your perspective, what are the most strange linker scripts of previous year? The kernel is probably the not strange, but like complicated. Let let me put this way, like the one that uses more fission. Right, and then. Uh, L Linux abuses linker script. Let, let me tell you. Like they use like link, they have like to build. I look at that linker script to build the kernel, the Linux kernel. It's like very very complicated, much more complicated than the previous one. And I'm not entire, I'm not very familiar with that, so I cannot comment further. But from the linker perspective, is hard to parse and. They, they use lots of directives. Uh, so, uh, actually, now that you mentioned that, honestly, I think that the only missing uh, directive to support uh, in uh, LLD for linker script is sections, because we have parse arithmetic expressions, we have keep to keep symbols, and then we have a line and. I don't remember all the linker script directives, but definitely session, sections is the big one. And there is an ongoing discussion now to implement this, so that should be sorted out soon. And yeah, of course, it, there is something that you need to not implement it just. Yeah. So, so one more, I have one more, actually. Uh, 
Have you thought about implementing uh, parallel linking? Like, uh, you know, this the linker to, 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 for example, when, when you want to link the previous D kernel, it's a single thread process. Huh. So you have like a thousand objects or something. Have you thought about when you're first making a new linker, uh, parsing linker scripts and everything, to, to have SMP support in it so, so you can yeah. churn through? Yeah, absolutely. Bit of a spoiler, so we do have it. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make a big difference. Like we, on a Mac Pro running Linux, you can link Chrome, Chromium in four seconds, something. I don't know how long it's to link the kernel, but like we have the times for like most stuff, but it's usually two to three times faster than gold. We do have threading, but most of the time, like uh, anything that has to happen parallel, just box on I.O. So. Yeah. It's generally like very I.O. at this point. The reason why link took long time in the old, in, in the linkers pre-gold is because the linker was doing a lot of work that could have been avoided, or at least could have been matched together. Gold introduced a support for thread, and that didn't make a lot of difference. I benchmarked that quite a bit. Um, there was a, a older design of LMD, which used a thread, and that also didn't make a lot of difference. So there are ideas, very experimental, to, I don't know, like try to read the file, the input file in parallel, but I'm not entirely sure how profitable it is. So somebody may actually implement that, but I'm not sure it, it will go upstream. What we have upstream is just writing the sections in parallel, but yes, it, it doesn't like, make a lot of it, it might make a difference if you're writing to like an old hard disk. Like I never ever benchmark the linker right right to our hard disk. This way like the kernel sees a bit more more of parallelism, but on SSD it doesn't make a difference or very small difference. Goldust is like more uh, sophisticated system where you have a task queue. Did they have a lot uh, more? Yeah, but yeah. they also doesn't. Use but it. that, yeah, I try to scale up the number of threads like big C++ binaries and that doesn't change a lot. Like the difference is like 20% more, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I've never really noticed the kernel of time being excessive even with GNU LD. It's like 10, 15 seconds. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, compared compared to the amount of time it takes to link, to, it takes new LD uh, 2.17 to link Clang uh, or to link LLDB. Mm -hmm. um, the kernel link is, is pretty much inconsequential. Yeah, I was just imagine this about uh, linker time. Maybe it is a disk subsystem issue that when you have a lot of maybe small files to read, that it takes more time than if you have fewer bigger files to read. So, so maybe uh, all of it has been all already discussed, just, but uh, maybe if you could make uh, kind of groups of objects and then link them together it might save some time and that brings up another issue in the tool chain I've seen uh, sometimes you have uh, C files which have identical names and then you need to use this object prefix maybe in the config in the kernel. And, uh, is there, are there any plans to, to, to change that so, so that you can, can, can build, for example, you can have two modules coexist having the same C files and uh, object names. Because currently, if you specify two places, for example, one driver uses en.c and the other one has an en.c as well, it won't link. 
because the problem, the constant utility, that R generates uh, the make bar. So is this that something someone has said before? It's not very hard to fix, at least in user space. I've got patches for it. I just haven't imported them because they because they behave really weirdly if you don't do make option. Should be fixed in the build system or in the, on the linker side. That's the request. I mean, in the base system, yeah, the it's base definitely system. a build system issue because all the files end up, all the object files end up in the same place. <laughs> so if you sure find <laughs> two like, em dot c, is you get one em dot o, and that's right. not really what you want. Right. Um, and for that, it just works. Um, it's not a very complicated chain. I'm not sure that I would advocate importing the chain, but we, I do have it. Uh, speaking of faster linking, there is also another uh, mode of linking which is like concurrent. You, the compiler starts, uh, the compiler compiles translation units, <coughs> and once they arrive, uh, you don't have to wait for all the, the object file to arrive before you invoke the linker. You start executing the linker and uh, you resolve symbol as you go. And so, uh, if you actually don't care about the um, uh, final executable, you expect you may have the final executable link being a little bit different because the order in which you pass the object file on the command line matters for symbol resolution then that may be faster, and that's an idea. Something that Gold tried to implement, but they never implemented entirely. I don't see they ever even tried. They, 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 the idea was just floated around. But was uh, just floated around. around, yeah. That's concurrent linking. And it's particularly useful if you have a distributed build system, but uh, given nobody actually implemented that, it's not sure how profitable it is. And quite a bit of things that show up in the profile are not, you have to wait for the profile anyway. <coughs> like for merging strings, okay, you can do some of it as they come along, but like if you're doing day padding, you have to wait for everything to sort. For applying locations, so unless you're gonna like do an incremental link, you also have to wait for everything because one of the last five got one byte bigger and now <coughs> every offset changes. So the the build ID, um, as mentioned before, is a, a hash uh, added to binaries and shared objects, um, and it's it's basically um, it, it is intended to be uh, you to be unique for the um, for any given binary or, or shared object, but there's no requirement that. There's no specification that says it has to cover all sections or um, or certain sections should be excluded. It's basically an implementation defined how it's actually calculated. But the idea is it's a it's a unique identifier for any library or um, or binary. And the the main uses for debugging cases. Um, so for example, if you have um, a, a binary that crashes, the core file will get a copy of the, the build ID because it's just stored in an elf note and not can be written out to the, the core file. And what it allows you to do, it allows the, the, the debugger to locate the original binary um, automatically given just the core file and to um, uniquely identify which build of a binary, for example, corresponded to the core file that you have. Um, so you, know, you can just type uh, lldb-c foo.core and it automatically knows, it can automatically find the foo that generated that core file. Um, and is it's, that, excuse me, is that recursive for all of the shared libraries as well? Yeah, how do um, I'm not sure what would happen in the web point. 
Yeah, you can say one of them, I think, as I said, it's pretty useless. Yeah. If you only say one, you don't have dependency chain. Yeah, um, the most interesting use case for me is for kernel cores, um, in which case um, uh, <coughs> you still have the, 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 a similar problem um, potentially with with modules, but um, yeah, so you, you can have all the kernel modules yeah. and kernel stuff all have the same stuff. Um, you only check when you get a kernel fresh dump is you get these swap strings. Uh, but the, those are um, those are not unique per build, right? They're not. Well, they're not necessarily intended to be. Um, they're, they're, they're supposed to be to help you find where the object came from, so that you can go find the tree and get the correct debug symbols and stuff. Mm -hmm. But you'd have to do that at, like, it's not automatically unique. Um, well, so we, we try to avoid generating stuff unnecessarily. So if all you're wanting to do is identify the tree where it was built, you don't want to rebuild the object that contains these strings every time. But if you did want it to be a unique instance of the build, then we would simply change the data so that it would change every time. And it would get rebuilt every time and we would have it. Yeah, I, I just mean that in the, in the, um, in the case of the build ID, I mean, one of the one of the benefits is that um, it, it uniquely it uniquely identifies the binary, so that if you um, if you have several if you have copies still of um, all kinds of old binaries that yeah. you so so your build ID is something you could take the execution yeah. file, just add your graphic hash or whatever you want to the stuff yeah. you stick in there, and yeah. you're done. I guess. Part of the build ID thing is also reproducibility, so that if you say, well, I have this build ID and I don't have any of those debug symbols, but if we have reproducible builds, I can go build them now and make sure that I have exactly the same outputs. Um, that's true, uh, but I'm not sure that, I mean, that doesn't really give you anything um, much over, um, it doesn't give you anything that you couldn't get by just hashing the binary yourself and, and, and storing that according to that hash, right? The unique thing about build ID is that the hash is embedded into the binary and then makes it into the core file. So why, why are you not save, saving the IDs from the shared libraries? Yeah, I mean, I guess, so in order to do that, what we would want to do is in the, um, uh, in our TLD, uh, Cache the, the build IDs oh, yeah. um, in the, uh, the the data that um, uh, that DL every P header for example uses. Um, yeah. So the way that the Linux distributions make use of it is they have a, a, a tree that has symlinks from um, the hash back to the original binary, so that uh, it uses that to follow. Um, the arbitrary. So even if you rename it, rename the core file or, or um, whatever, uh, you find the original binary um, by following the link from the, the hash. That's it. Yeah, okay. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's actually a lot easier to produce a string in the binary that literally comes from the tree. The the yeah, but that, that requires that your tree then it corresponds to the the source you were running, right? Or the, the binary you're running. Absolutely. So, I mean, if, if you're somebody like that, us, anything that we ship to a customer, the tree is kept forever. Right. Um, 
but in the, in the build ID case, you could get um, you could get a, a core file from a customer without knowing necessarily what version they're even running and be able to um, to debug it. How? Because the the hash is unique. But the hash, but the hash you, you were describing just before the hash requires that you have a tree somewhere that provides index space. But, yeah, but I'm saying you have you you're saying you keep the trees already, right? So right. So. So having the hash and then having to have a tree of siblings buys you nothing over having the explicit part in the binary to start with. But the, the, that, so if you build every time in a unique path, you, that would work. But, and if you don't, the hashes don't, don't necessarily work. No, they do, because you can, in, you can independently track that to a, a given source tree or a given build, right? Maybe I'm just understanding. If I, if, I, if I take the classic, I put a tree, I build it, I ship you a binary, and then I build it again, and you send me back a core file, great, I know that your core file came from this tree, and the, 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 binary, the content, the state of the tree is no longer what I shipped you. So it buys me nothing. But you can capture that, that tree, right? You can store that entire tree. If I store that entire tree, then the hash versus the explicit Well, but I still have to know which which binary jet which which specific binary generated that core file. Uh, okay. Maybe it would probably be much simpler if I show you an example. Yeah, we should just chat over the break or because it like as I say, you, you take any core file from any of our boxes, you just run what, you know what crashed, uh, where it was built, when it was built, what branch it was built from, and so on. So you have a flat list, so does does that depend? Do you have a flat global namespace for? Do you have a flat global namespace for your trees then? Uh, the, the the build host is included in, in the string, so it's a you know auto mounted unique uh, name. So you have a flat global namespace. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It looks like we are uh, uh, at the break time. So um, let's see if we can bring up the schedule again and then. So we've got a half an hour break and then another uh, hour in here. So it is break time um, to go ahead and do the break thing, but you know, be back in five minutes or whenever I can find Colin.
some point. Uh, you know, all these. And they are in. Yeah, yeah. And round that bit. Yeah. Um, that's actually an interesting question. I mean, I think it was something that we would. Um, it, it is probably a non-starter, um, but I think it would be interesting to see. Uh, the the linker is it's pretty much certain that um, uh, that we're going to have a long tail of ports that require uh, GNU LD. Because um, I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be ports that do crazy linker script things that we just don't want to bother. I, you know, a one-off port that, that does something really bizarre, we just don't want to bother um, bother implementing support. Um, for for AR, though, I would assume that um, probably the, the na native AR generally is uh, is able to do anything that ports wants, and we can probably um, verify that with an X run, but uh, it's an interesting thing to, to investigate and just see how, how far off we actually would be. Sorry, what was the question? Um, can, could we switch to the BSD AR format um, from GNU AR? Another complaint that shows up a lot is LLVM tools being big. I'm not sure if anybody hit this issue, like big in size, because they ship with supports with for multiple architecture and for multiple formats. I, how much of that size is really the back end, and how much of it is? Not very good shared library support. Uh, I mean, shared libraries are totally broken upstream at the moment. So, I, I, I don't know. Large part is, yeah. Large part is like they got big code support for these tools. AS is like 15 megabytes. AR is 15 megabytes. Well, AR, the annoyance of AR is the way, is a technicality of like how the bit code format right now works. So for you to be able to get all the samples that have to meet the targets, it's something I wish to fix at some point, but yeah, it's not going to be fixed anytime soon. You could add a, like a no LTO flag, in which case LFMAR is going to be like one, one hundredth of the size of that it is now. But Even if that is fixed, AES will be down bigger. Not necessarily. Not, not necessarily, OK. Yeah. From my perspective, the the size of the tools is not a big concern um, because typically um, the tool chain isn't getting isn't getting shipped on the smallest of embedded devices where where, where size is a, a, a strong consideration. Um, but the build time certainly is uh, is a common complaint. Would there be any appetite to always? Treating every build as an external tool chain build, even if it's something from source, that we treat that as just a special case of external. It's done. I think the the no, sorry, it's in the back. Yeah, the, the answer is behind you. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's a good question. Um, I mean, I know all the MIG support is there, but I'd actually like to do that. Like for a lot of reasons. Or maybe, you know, with system compiler should always be the default or, or some other mechanism, but it's ridiculous how often we rebuild a huge piece of software, which actually isn't changing all that often. Is there anyone here who would strongly object to relying on a compiler that is not in the source tree? Or object at all. Anyone? Bueller? We can bring the same discussion tomorrow. Yeah. See what they want to yeah. And as we move to a package base, then. Well, if the print form option that's needed by the kernel. That's upstream. It's upstream now. Okay. I think it also kind of depends on the architecture because if, we, if I have to depend on a package for uh, getting the compiler and the linker installed, but I don't have a package repo 
for that architecture, like Armour on 64, for example, then I'm out of luck. Well, so the, the intent would be, um, so today the, the claim that you build in the, um, in the tree will target um, any of the architectures that we support, uh, the FreeBSD supports, um, and that the, the, the intersection of the architecture supported by FreeBSD and upstream. So you can't, um, uh, can't build RISC-5 uh, with entry claim, for example. Um, but uh, the, the idea would be um, that you don't need an ARM64, you don't need an ARM64 cross-compiler claim installed as a package or a native. Um, uh, so if you want to build ARM64, you just install the compiler package and it can, com it can compile x86 and ARM. But if that package isn't even available? Um, well, so the, the intent would be that that package is available. Like we're, we're saying, what, what we provide in the base system now would be an, a, available to much downstream pro provider like Carbon BSD, for example, doesn't have ARM64 packages. But I can't install Intel on ARM64. Yeah, I, I think I think it would be beneficial also to have basic cross-build support for a small subset of. Um, yeah, the only problem with that is uh, to get basic with official uh, build system right now. You end up with having to build things which are not designed to be called build, like perf. you to have provided preceded thousands of config files for all the potential targets you want to probably build to, meaning for us one for every version of FreeBSD supported, uh, plus one for each target, times one for each target. Uh, and so per, per is the big nightmare for that, and per is needed very early in the build process for GCC, users, whatever, because of a lot of things. Right now. Yeah. And we 
just made in a bunch of PSMA parts. Uh, that's you probably not say you don't depend on anything installed, uh, like get X and so on. The thing is, it's more than you maintain that for each release. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I was just going to say that that more work is all, is work that we're already doing today. Um, yeah. Effectively, right? It would be um, it would be nice to avoid the extra work, um, but as as a um, a, a step on the path to doing that, that might be. Well, the bonus of the extra work is for those two chain, you can strip it down to the very you know set you need. Uh, why sometimes the other stream comes with a bunch of tools and doesn't provide flags to be able to disable or to allow to disable or enable to. Uh, the the extra work gives you more flexibility and uh, to, to, it would be easier to do why, for example, the PCC uh, when I stood it down for uh, XML chain. Uh, if I had to make them on the make parts rather than trying to have some magical set going on there and modifying that and it actually it's upgrade, you have to verify that everything is okay. That's basically the same work that we do already with the two shape of the PCs. It's just having a little tree somewhere. Mm -hmm. Or even the boss tree, but saying use those main parts. Is there any thought to having, like right now we sort of have, here's the code we write, which we call the base system, which is everything else. Is there any thought to having, here's the code we write, here's the stuff that, well, we didn't write it, but we're going to support it in this kind of more detailed way, whether it's creating our own make files so it's easy to bootstrap, et cetera. So well, that kind of tree. Uh, well, exactly. Like the things in contrib, the fact that we rebuild those every time I take thing, um, and they, they are quite <coughs> they are quite different from what the basis is. Right? So yes. So, so is there any discussion of having instead of two levels, three levels of? of yeah, there are discussions of that. Okay. <laughs> fights. So. No fights. No fights. <laughs> 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 well, the base build doesn't actually build using any any build system. No, it doesn't use the, con the build system. Right. Also, question for you. Do you have any plan to provide alternative build system for, let's so, say... So, the work that Dimitri does right now is that he generates maybe files every time a new client request is done. But uh, this is sort of like extra work because we could directly use CMake and now that base is getting packaged. We'll see if we were to do that then we it basically ports anyway. Yeah. That's what ports does is it wraps for build systems. Okay. So if the base build needed to start wrapping a, a CMake build, we might as well be using ports to build base. <laughs> it's one of the advantages of pushing playing out to ports. Yeah. If the, the port can use CMake at the once. Right. Yes. Yeah. Our big problem is that the window between updates is very large. So basically, we import every six months plan, and things break. Like suddenly, there is no way of doing like continuous integration with new version of plan. Mainly because somebody has to do the work of doing the translation, like make file conversion. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think there's there's no question that there are some very convenient um, convenient attributes provided by the um, the the entry build infrastructure for a client, uh, but there's also a big cost to maintaining that. So for reporting a CMake project, we could probably make a script that reads all the CMake files and creates the make files at least for claiming. I can probably work with, with <laughs> My understanding is that right now I've been scanning. So I think it's so all manual, then we can probably automate a lot of it. So I, I thought Dimitri actually had some um, partial automation for it. Yeah. Um, well, maybe if if the, the, the other VM product always stand on the same subset of CMake syntax, uh, we could write kind of. <laughs> Make light. <laughs> 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 uh, we could. We could. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it's a, it's a matter yeah, of like, so, so there's no parsing. Uh, what I mean, I said, see if I just something that would translate to the rigor of these make parse. Well, what you could do is run CMake 
and your output to some make files, which is a more regular syntax that you could then use. To, you could parse that. And you could have any kind of that What's the problem just using C? Well, I think it's the bootstrapping thing. Yep. So I don't really like taking the compiler out of the source tree. I think that was a question. Um, I don't really get to reproducibility because if I want to build you know, 5.0, PPC 5.0, how do I how do I do that if it didn't have a compiler in the tree? If I use the compiler back in as from today, playing yeah. pre-release, I'm probably not going to build pre-release. Well, and I, I think that's a good point in particular because you're not going to be able to download the version of the package you used to build right. the release. Because you can't have multiple it'll be versions gone because we'll have applied a patch right. somewhere. Uh, and I, so I think, from the, I think there is a lot of value in switching the default. So most of the time you use the one on your base system or the one from ports as required. But I really like, I really do like the ability to bootstrap the compiler in the source tree. Right. I don't think it, I think it helps quite a bit. Um, and actually, it gives us something to integrate against as the baseline, you know, these features pretty much need to work. Um, we can tweak the make system, you know, we can add things like the make new make depend stuff. Um, we can add IR generation, um, that sort of thing, against a baseline that's kind of fixed. <coughs> that's probably more useful for things that are either gonna be totally defaulted or widely supported that forever, like the dash M flags for defense, um, or for things that we're going to do only with the internal tool chain. And, you know, if you want to do something else, well, enjoy. You know, have fun. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. If it doesn't, don't complain. Although, so I don't disagree. But if you try to build FreeBSD five with the compiler that was in uh, the source tree, first you're going to have to build that compiler, and that compiler is probably not going to build with a modern compiler. Because of but, but today you can just boot a uh, virtual machine with uh, FreeBSD5 and compile it, I guess. Sure, but if we're talking about keeping virtual binaries, uh, virtual machines which are binaries around, then how is that different from caching old binary so I'm, packages? I'm not really concerned about the 5 case. What I'm concerned about is that I can't, is building 10.2. Um, and yeah. if, if I'm using experience. external tool chains, I could not reproduce the environment that I'm built 10.2 in today. That wouldn't be a possible thing because that package repo wouldn't exist. Even, or we could save it, in which case we'd be saving, you know, every week's snapshot of the, of, of the package repo at, what, 20, 40 gigs or something? <laughs> and, and even if we did save it all, we couldn't have two versions of playing 3.8 installed. Yeah. If, the, if you need claim 3.8, First revision of the package to build the 10 pre release. Yeah, but you yeah. need the claim 3 the 10 revision of the package then, to then build you, then you 11. Need, you can't do that. Then you need Docker for your reproducible build <laughs> <laughs> And then you've lost. The yeah. <laughs> I mean, so um, I'm giving a reproducible talk, reproducible builds talk on Saturday, and have discussed um, reproducible builds at length with lots of Linux people who have exactly that problem, right? Uh, they're, you know, they're talking about whole schemes for recording the build info so that you can recreate the environment um, that you used to, to, to be able to reproducibly build something. And Baptiste and I, you know, we're, we're chatting with them and we're just kind of sitting there smugly uh, <laughs> ignoring all the problems because, you know, in, in FreeBSD, absolutely, it is, um, it's uh, incredibly powerful that uh, FreeBSD 10.3 is a unique identifier that says here is a environment for reproducibly building all the stuff that came came with that. Um, so that certainly is yeah is, is a, a, a big um, big consideration. Um, 
other thing is for, no, no, it's fine. For Putagher, is there a way to change executables in the base systems? Because this would make integration much, much easier. Like testing new version of the compiler or the or something. Right now, I just like simulate. You, you can provide a patch when you build a JLab. When you build the pre-layer jailer, you can provide a patch for the source tree. That's you, you want to drop in a binary that yes, exists. Yeah, binary. So yeah, you, you asked me that first. You had that already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've got I've got a build of LLD um, that I want to drop in as if it were user bin LD and see what happens. I can talk to you about that later. Yeah. So, so, so currently, to do that, what we do is the the jail is ZMS. Data set by default, we use ZFS, and it codes it based on a snapshot called clean. If you delete that snapshot, overwrite the binaries, and then make a snapshot with that name, it will then clone jails with the modified binaries. Okay. I can make a command to do this too. It would be it would be useful for this case, I think, if there were a Kubernetes command that um, uh, you could give it a tar. Then it will extract all the root. It would be really helpful if FreeBSD had a better way to type that best than using Giving it a tar just for the specific build and have it use that on top of the jail that it already has instead yeah. of changing the snapshot of the jail. Yeah, that is quite so. The object's work is very easy to do. It has a code in the package image. It gives very easy definition of overlay. Um, spending effort on dealing with in-place <laughs> upgrades is like the halfway to hell as far as I'm concerned. If you want to be able to update something, new can pave and come at it with, with a clean environment. In-place upgrades, there's just an infinite amount of complexity to it to solve, resolve there. If you want to change out some form of a layer um, in terms of file systems for whatever you exact, or for like, it's just, it's sadness all the way down. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I don't disagree. I think what we're what we're talking about though is basically how you create that um, that initial um, uh, clean thing that you're installing from. Yeah. So we're basically saying we we want some tooling in Pudrier to take what um, basically tooling built in to create a new environment um, chain modified from an existing environment. So that's, that's basically what, what Pudrier is doing yeah. now, right? Yeah. 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 With that kind of view, we may build Clang every time, even every week, and build a new like support clip and catch regressions. So, yeah. is, is there a Pudrier infrastructure to do a baseline build and compare the results? Sort of. What, what do you mean? For X runs, we do we, we have an external script that's used to compare two different Pudrier runs to find regressions and changes. But it's, there's there's nothing um, committed in the Pudrier to do that comparison yet. It, it could it could end up there. Yeah. It could. Yeah, whether it, it relies on the web interface also. output to do the comparison because mm. it generates metadata about what failed to build mm -hmm. a nice JSON file. Yeah. Then we just parse the two mm. JSON that's files that's to find changes. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in using that as well to plug it into the Jenkins um, infrastructure that the Debian reproducible builds people are running now. Um, so they, for FreeBSD, they basically have um, Jenkins SSHing to a FreeBSD VM and it builds, um, it builds FreeBSD 10.2 
from SVN twice, and then since it's not reproducible, and I mean that's not particularly useful right now. Um, but uh, um, what I would really like to have it have the Jenkins, um, uh, the Debian Jenkins uh, infrastructure do is invoke Bootier and um, <laughs> and then have some reasonable way of doing the comparison. Uh, so I created an issue on GitHub and linked it in the, the notes. Okay. If anybody wants to try cool. their edge, share your own stuff. So for my for my talk when I was collecting data, I just ran it twice and copied the resulting packages um, <coughs> for, specifically for reproducible builds. I cared about the actual content of all those packages, so I just copied them to another um, uh, another directory. I didn't care about um, build failures because my, my interest is only when the same package build twice is it the same or not. Um, and so from there, I just uh, hashed all of them and compared the, the resulting text files. Uh, but for automation, we're going to want something a little bit more interesting. So, um, one of the products that, or one of the tools, it's open source, one of the tools that we have is a, is a cluster scheduler. Um, and I just added FreeBSD support about two weeks ago. Um, what I don't have yet right now is FreeBSD jail support. What's interesting about this and what you guys were just talking about there is, is you should be able to submit two jobs and have that run in parallel and be able to collect results. Possible tool chain topic we might want to think about is what sort of new tool would we like to see um, either because we want them or to give us a competitive edge, uh, particularly with like, people finding ways to put D tracks into their system and things like that. Yeah. Um, so Brooks, Brooks's comment was um, what sort of uh, tools might we want to see either because we just want them. Or because they could give us a competitive advantage um, and show off a capability that, uh, or enable a capability that really isn't available elsewhere. You know, I think the reproducible build stuff. While other people started it, I think we have the potential to take it farther in some ways. Then, yeah, I, I have some interesting graphs from my my talk on the effort that the um, uh, the Debian people have been putting in, and there's a lot of people putting in a lot of work there. Um, you know, and, and in the FreeBSD case, um, there was an experimental patch tested, um, uh, I think March 2015, and we had 65% um, of ports uh, built reproducibly with that patch. Um, I, I have started the run, uh, experiments with ports um, with a similar kind of change, and it's basically just our, our package building infrastructure. It's not changes to any individual um, you know, ports, and we're at 80% now. Uh, and you know it's I, I, and the result the, the remaining ones probably with a few tool chain issues um, will we'll knock out a few more. Um, there certainly will be a long tail of, of uh, silliness in individual packages to deal with, um, but you know with with almost 
almost no effort, um, we've been able to get uh, to a level that it took uh, people without the same sort of integrated um, integrated concept of the base system, you know, many man years of uh, of effort um, to achieve. How do you deal with the stuff which embeds uh, timestamps into the? Into the um, so you should come to my talk on Saturday. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> uh, basically, uh, because this is a tool, this is a tool chain session, we can uh, can discuss it. Um, the way I, I prefer to deal with things that embed timestamps is to stop those things from embedding timestamps. Um, and you know, my, my, my goal is to, um, to spread the, the word of saying, you, know, you don't want to put built by user on date in this path on dollar sign host into your binary. Um, uh, barring that, um, there's a standard that the, the Debian folks um, uh, created um, so a whole, uh, the, the intent is that build tools, um, so compilers and uh, document uh, format conversions, like your PDF generators and all of that, uh, will look for an environment variable source underscore data underscore epoch. And if that is set, it will use um, that as an epoch time uh, as the representation of the current time um, instead of the actual current time. Fine. It's interesting the timestamp gets actually embedded into the A archives. Yeah, so so uh, um, so A so AR um, the, the the FreeBSD AR the base system by default um, puts in zeros for the timestamps. Um, I think the one from bin utils is probably user user local bin AR is probably still defaulting to including those timestamps. Um, so I'd like to switch that to just not include them. Um, I don't think they're particularly useful for anything, uh, and if anyone really wants them, they can turn them on. Um, but uh, timestamps end up in all kinds of crazy, uh, um, crazy places, and so there's all kinds of tools that either create file system images or things like that that also end up uh, with them. Um, AR is a classic example of something that was designed for an environment that makes, you know, a home router, a home Wi-Fi router look like a giant machine with tons of RAM and storage. And so it's ridiculous that we're doing anything that it does. So there are probably a bunch of things. There's probably a lot of mileage we can get out of client and LLVM, which we're already getting some, right? Um, yeah. In terms of the, the lock checking that we're doing and that kind of stuff is fantastic. Um, and we just get that for free because of the uh, compiler. Um, but, yeah, there are lots of sanitizer things that we might be able to employ to great effect. Something else we've been thinking about in our research uh, project that a few of us are involved in um, is trying to get some fat binary support where we would ship LLVM bit code <coughs> in an ELF section that you could then retarget to a, mi not, not to a different architecture, but a micro architecture. Um, for optimization opportunities while still having something to fall back to that looks like everybody else's debug symbols and that kind of thing. Yeah, some, some of those things um, are areas I'd really like to, uh, I think that's, that was that was sort of the crux of Brooks's comment, right, is that um, we, we, in FreeBSD we have a somewhat unique opportunity to be able to take advantage of things like that um, and it would be nice to capitalize on that. I, I think there are some things that you know I would like from my debug, de debugger that are probably not in scope for FreeBSD. Just to give you a crazy example, um, in our project we have queue producing instruction level traces um, of all runtimes. I would really like to teach LLDB to understand that trace so I can slide back and forth in time. Um, yeah. So that's probably out of scope for our project. But I think there are things that are not quite that crazy that are probably <laughs> in scope. I think we should think about that sort of thing um, and see you know, what we can do. Um, and we do, I think, because in part because of our Titan integration, in part because our early LLVM adoption and whatnot, um, we do get used more than we were for a while in research, for instance. Um, the fact that you know, with a little more documentation, um, we can probably make it very easy for most research projects to you know, fire up a Pugriar instance and build with their crazy ass protection compiler. Um, and that might be something that would be worth documenting, for instance. Uh, 
Bruce could, needs to get Baptiste to agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thing on the list of so <clears throat> things I would like to see is a supported IE for FreeBSD. I use BI, but some people like IDEs a lot. So, and it's a grad student at Cambridge who spent quite a long time um, getting his K developed environment set up. So, might be, we should be able to get him to present at BSD Camp if we were asking. Doesn't George used Eclipse to some? George, George has done some, but um, Alex Rodriguez is doing a bunch of um, uh, oh, sorry. Other one. So uh, is, is doing, has like a whole K development environment. I think he can click and get build rule to run. Uh, it'll be much better with Brian once I get the latest stuff from Brian imported into our tree. But. And so that, that work is. Uh, is extensive and tedious, but it's largely integration, right? He's not actually having to develop. Yeah, he's not writing much new yeah. stuff. He's written yeah. some scripts yeah. um, and, um, and sort of worked through it. So getting him to talk about that yeah. and put that somewhere. Yeah, I think that, and that is something. Do it on FreeBSD instead of on Linux. Yeah, that, that is one thing I would really like to see us do a better job of in FreeBSD um, is document and present that kind of integration work. Um, because a lot of times we've had we've had sort of great tools that are all just individually um, individual tools targeting all kinds of individual um, uh, uh, point projects, but we sort of lacked, I think, in some cases, a cohesive um, layer above that that brings it all together into a, a nice end user environment. So if I can make a comment there. Um I'm really new to BSD development, and John has me looking at uh, GZIP and CACIP. So one of the things I wanted to do was just to go in, build world, then change into the uh, GZIP directory and build from there. And you have to set up a lot of variables from the make files and stuff like that. And one thing I found, maybe I just wasn't looking in the right place, but it's not. There's, I couldn't find a document that sort of explained the make files and the includes and stuff. And it was a painful process to get that there. So from the point of view of new developers, uh, something that would help there would be nice. So the other than the commit that? logs. <laughs> other than the commit logs. <laughs> yeah. John found some of the commit logs. There's uh, in share mk bsd dot readme is where you can look for the documentation for the, the framework. And if you actually want to do a build in a subdirectory, you need to do make build m from the top level first. Otherwise, it's, it's just not going to work. Yeah, and we got that sort of a, a much more convoluted way than that. Even if that file was in the top level directory or something in the top level directory pointing you to that. Because yeah. knowing the look in share and so on and so forth was something I just didn't know where to look. Yeah. What the build system probably needs is uh, some spot in the developer's handbook that describes here's how everything yeah. is brought together. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we, we really do lack that kind of, um, I mean, a lot of those sorts of sorts of techniques, um, once you finally climb the mountain and figure it out, it's, it's self-evident now and it doesn't need to be documented, right? That seems to be a common, um, a common theme. Um, I'll, I'll, and I, I'll work on documenting that for the handbook. Yeah. Perfect. I can talk about some of the pages too. Um, so one of the questions that I had Ports, debug symbols? Yes. I have, we use a patch at Isilon, I have a patch that will split out debug symbols into the, the proper directory format. But Let's do it. <laughs> but we need some packages for ports because we don't build with debugging in ports currently. And so if I enable this, it will you know, increase the size of all of our packages. It won't make users very happy. Uh, it'd be much better if they could just install the debug symbol package is it is it reasonable to commit um, at least the infrastructure to support that? So I can it, make it a build option. Yeah, so that if... Oh, okay. well, there is also another opportunity. There is this new technologies like Dwarf, Dwarf 5, so for us maybe it's far away. 
if the bug feature is to reduce the size of the bug. Okay. Something that may be worth it. Right. But I think even even if we have that, I think we still we still want to be able to ship without debug data and have you install it as a separate step later on. I could at least add it as a as a universal option in ports. There's a few ports that will probably break with this patch, like uh, I think Go breaks if you strip the binaries. Yeah. yeah. Oh, if you <coughs> So I, I don't know if there's other ports that have this problem. Yeah, I, I've heard of Go having problems like that. I'm not somewhere saying that I'm not safe for that. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I know Go, I know two others, I don't remember which one, but uh, there was at, at least two others that were just breaking. Right. You should use the strip and add up. Yeah. The, the BSD yeah. Mac options can't let you make or say no, whatever that option is. Well, this, is, this would be purely important. Sorry? This is just purely important for everyone. Right, but you presumably had a similar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what this what this patch actually does is when the build is done, because Ports is staging everything that it builds into a directory, there's a script that runs a find on the stage or runs file again. It's either file or read all. I think it's actually read all now. Uh, looks for anything that has the, the debug uh, simple table and then splits it out. That way you don't have to identify what's a binary in your plist or anything. It just it just works. Um. On, on a related note, um, because we because we've switched um, to Elf Toolchain for all of our sort of general binary utilities, we have an opportunity. Our little binary, like the sort of mis miscellaneous binary utilities, we have an opportunity to develop tools that add new functionality relatively easily. So, I mean, if if you end up in a case where you've got this weird pipeline of read Elf pipe to grab pipe to whatever and uh, something like that. I'll show you um, what I have. <laughs> it, we, 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 could, we could certainly make a tool that you give it a, um, a whole bunch of arguments and it just echoes the file name for um, the ones that it found that have, yeah, that uh, really cool. um, have, have the associated section. The one case that actually was problematic was when I ran across .8 files mm -hmm. because then it spat out all the objects that were in there that also had the bugs tools. Some, some ports will break without debugging for because they rely on the existence of symbols, like to see where the BSS starts. So maybe this is why it will break. But I don't think there's going to be many of them. Well, there's symbols, of, there's particular symbols we've broken on ARM64 and RISC-5, so. Yeah, any port that relies on BSS, yeah. It's not, yeah, it's not as funny. Yeah. Well, I'll commit this with an option as default off. Yeah. If I mean, break some stuff, we'll just have like, to find out there's. I, I would, I would be personally very interested in having a um, a local um, uh, Pudmir run that um, that has that, that has debug turned on and builds um, Chromium and Firefox, for example. Yeah, you don't want that. Firefox is easy. Chromium, you would just not be able to make. Oh, yeah. I'd say for MibreOffice. Oh, no, you just need a claim to no, before. Oh, no, you will. The last build I did for MibreOffice back in the time of Chromium was the same. Uh, I could link, but I could have loaded it to the debugger. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, so. One, uh, was they, one was blowing up during the link, the other one was uh, blowing up during the, the, the debugger. Yeah, so. Um, <laughs> little uh, um, digression here, but. Uh, so Chromium, if you built it with debug, it used to crash as soon as you started it, right? Is that what you, you saw and then you tried to debug it? Is that the...? Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it turns out um, it's because there was a limit on the size of the .tex section that um, RTL, or the kernel will, uh, okay. will accept. Um, <laughs> and, and you get no useful di diagnostic when this, this happens. Um, you just get a message that says, you know, failed. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so that, that is that is now fixed, um, and you can actually build Chromium with debug and run it, uh, okay. and debug it. Because when I was part of the time, it was a pain. Yeah. It must yeah. take forever to start, because that's the kernel use of not very full. Oh, yeah. It, it, and, and I mean, and it takes, uh, so one of the, um, LLDB is supposed to have um, lazy loading of, of debug and, and not spend a lot of time doing this sort of thing. One of the troubles with standalone debug on FreeBSD right now, um, oh, that's the other reason, um, uh, this reminds me, the other reason we wanted build ID. Um, 
right now, when you open a binary in, in the debugger on FreeBSD, it, it runs a CRC32 of the entire uh, text to compare that um, against the, um, the, debug, uh, the debug file. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you open up Chromium in LLDB, it takes a very, very long time for it to go and, and do that on everything. Um, the build ID, um, build ID is stored in both the uh, main binary and the standalone debug, and the debugger just opens the, the debug file, it thinks it's associated, reads the debug ID, and says it's the, or the build ID, and says it's the same, so it doesn't need to do any of that, uh, that reading. Uh, there was this, the, this leaking feature that you wanted to work on to reduce uh, debugging, debug load time, debug at load time, right? Debugger. So the two debug features that come to mind, so DWO, oh DWO, sorry, uh, yeah, GDB DWO. index, like uh, the gold can fit in the GDB index, which now it's called the dwarf something five something something index. Mm -hmm. So basically if you build with DWO, like just that, then the debugger gets a lot, the linker gets faster, because it's not processing like a million yeah. locations, but then the debugger gets slower because it goes to check every file. Yeah. If you build just the debug index, then the linker gets slower because now there's more work to do. If you use both, it's a pretty sweet spot. Like the linker just creates an index, so the debugger doesn't have to open every file. Yeah. And the one thing that breaks with that is Ccache, but we have to like make a way with you create a DWO. It's a fusion of a feature. So like you just, you you're not creating locations. Like these things are just like still on data, but they're still in the same file. So. But yeah, that's on the to do, do list. And that should be Chromium debuggable without. And I'm needing a lunch break when you start. Yeah, waiting forever, yes. So what do we want to do? I mean, lib, so, lib, so, so libsoft on um, ARM is letting us move to hard float because in practice, all the ARMv6s and above actually have hard float as one unit. So we have libsoft to let old code work sort of like lib32. Um, we probably should do the same on MIPS. I don't think it's all that hard, but it looks at something that people doesn't look at. Yeah, it doesn't currently look at it, so. Yeah, but in reality, when you build the final image, it either has float, uh, soft float or not, and all of your binaries are the same brick. That's so where you, 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 really, you really don't want to uh, package a soft float if none of your binaries are used in other way around. Yes, you want to split them. Yes. Um, Is there any value that gets entirely right? As is there any file <laughs> that gets multi lib right currently? That I don't know. Um, I've got I've got another use case in our research project where um, there are definitely going to be two first class APIs on the system at the same time um, for the indefinite future, um, and so there we would need some sort of multi lib support as well, um, where we'll have native libraries um, and Cherry libraries, or it might be that Cherry libraries are the Fault. Once that becomes an architecture, and 64-bit for BSD libraries would be, the, would be the second one, so that the LM64. Maybe there is a value in standardizing it, though. So that is formalizing where you know, install that stuff. Yeah, and and on Cherry, we're going to want to have it in ports. And yeah. It would be interesting, um, also for. Um, uh, I mean, we have lots of convenient infrastructure um, for running QMU user mode, um, and it would be nice to be able to sort of support that in a more integrated, uh, um, more integrated way. I think too, in a similar. 
similar infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, what's the state of documentation on that? On um, community user mode? Yeah. Um, it's confusing wiki pages. Yeah, uh, I don't think there is a, a single cohesive kind of document. Um, Brian, do you know if there's any info? On the community user mode, um, the use of community user mode and... and Wrote something if it works, it yeah, I tried it last year. <laughs> yeah, maybe the wiki page is correct. It didn't yeah, seem to do what I was doing. Like, it, wasn't, it wasn't clear how it would tell if any of the steps would work. Other than running it all and hoping that this big pile would stop all did the right thing at the end. So I guess yeah, we've got yeah, two hours basically before um, before dinner, so we can we can hack on tool chain things or whatever else is interested in doing. Thank you for showing up. Thank you. Oh. Next question. Any other kills meets what the guys you guys care about? Meets question for anyone that uses MIPS, what ABI do you guys care about? I only care about N64. Which one? N64. Like little enemy game? Uh, big. Big, okay. Both are good. Huh? Both are good. Both are good. Okay. Listen to this. They're all will be on the United States. They feel it's the better.